Say hello. Hi. <laughs> Do you hear yourself? Was that funny? Huh? Can you say it again? My daughter just likes to breathe in the top of the mic. Can you say it again? I did that. <laughs> you want to hear yourself? Hold on. Let's throw some headphones on you. Okay, into the ads now. This episode, this round two with James Arthur Ray was... This guy blows my socks off every time. No matter the darkness he's ever faced, he always comes out swinging. He is so knowledgeable. He is in the epitome of a philosopher. Sorry, I'm chewing gum, my bad. Um, The ultimate no-no, chewing into a microphone, whatever. James Arthur Ray is a gift, and he is someone who has faced so much in his life. He is a corporate coach. He is able to guide anyone in the right direction, no matter where they may be in life. He is, I can honestly say he's a teacher and he's a friend now. And good news, we are going to be having him speak at Where the Minds Meet with Gabor Mate, Dennis McKenna, and Dr. Joe Tuffer, hosted by Giselle Ugardi. I'm excited for this one because we are focused on human potential, plant medicine, and behavioral science. What makes our clock tick? We are creatures of habit, accepting that fact. We are born addicts. That's what we are. It's just a matter of what are we addicted to? Now, me personally... I'm finding myself uh, addicted to my loved ones and addicted to my <laughs> addicted to my work, addicted to uh, pushing forward. And that's kind of the cool thing we talked about in this podcast in regards to the process. I um, try to make healthy things habitual as opposed to harmful things. And that is, in my world, that's the only place I can be is... Uh, a place where I am habitually doing positive things, helping people, things like that, being a glue piece. Um, So there's kind of a, (laughs) hello, princess. She's addicted to going outside in her diaper, playing at her water table while yelling tomfoolery at the dog and cat, right? You want to say something? Hello. (laughs) <laughs> what else you got to say? Bye, guys. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, my little 14-month-old, she's spitting knowledge already. I love her so much. Right, 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 right. Can you say daddy? Daddy. <laughs> we got a little something out of her. Cool. Um, yeah, shout out to my sponsors, Lapidary Jewelers, your, your um, original custom jeweler there's another one in town who wants to claim to be the you're the only custom jeweler in the med city get out of here lapidary jewelers is the original custom jeweler that's the long and the short of it he made me he had his boys make me this awesome custom stationary astronaut with our logo I got a message one day. Hey, check this out. Hey, babe, could you let the animal, I mean the cat out, I mean the animal out, I mean uh, whatever, that thing we call our daughter out? Please. She's freaking out, man. Yeah, he hit me up with this with this um, model, and it wasn't a finished piece yet, but it was a mold, and I was like, what is this thing? And sure enough, it turned into the stationary astronaut that I rock around my chest. Right, Mia Joe? Right, baby girl? I said that. <laughs> Hi, baby. Hi. Hi. Uh-uh. What are you going to say? Oh, you want to come up? Yeah, come here. Uh, five. Come here. Should we talk to these goofballs? We got a couple more sponsors. Uh-uh. 
Okay. So also I'd like to give a shout out to my boy Caleb at Social Works. We've been doing a lot of work. If you need any social media advertisement, we got your back. Uh, we build funnels for businesses and uh, make sure that your product, that your service is known by the masses. By you. We, know your, we know your demographic and your clientele before you even know them. And that's the cool thing about this, um, what we're able to do. And we're helping out so many influencers, local and national, as well as companies. Um, it's just an awesome place to be, especially in today's day and age. Everyone's kind of waking up after the uh, kind of the Gary V experience over the last year. Everyone's waking up to the fact that they have to kind of be a walking a walking entity in regards to online um, promotion and uh, your brand identity has to be known. And it's not so much, you don't always need to know what these people do, but you need to know of them. And that's very important because, um, you know, it's the game of entertainment nowadays. You have to be have to be known. And some people are okay with not being. That's that's fine. I mean, if you're just a worker bee, that is totally okay. You do not need to have brand identity. It is all good, but so many people are walking LLCs and they need to be known. It's very important. Attention pays these days. And I have influencers who might not sell anything, but they do speaking tours all over the all over the planet. And for instance, one of them has trouble selling in Australia. When he goes, sells fine in UK, has trouble selling in Australia. Well, um, there that's a problem there. Uh, just because your podcast listeners, um, you have a lot of them in the UK, uh, and, and you have some in the Australia. Well, we need to create your. We need to form your brand identity and awareness of who you are, what you do through the sales funnel which we're not trying to sell them anything. We're just trying to get you more listeners so you can sell seats to your speaking engagements when you're on the road. And that's what we do as well. So we're able to help you out big time. Also, Social Butterfly, shout, shout out to Social Butterfly. Always helping me out with some media opportunities and uh, my camera guys and stuff like that. And of course, Optimal Movement. We as a family went to the chiropractor today, got cracked up, got cupped up. I go see Phil Kish, the owner, next week to get poked up. He's a master acupuncturist. So I'm I'm excited. You know, it's take care of your body first, man. Take care of your body. Take care of your body. It is so important. Don't give up on it. It will fail you if you don't take care of it. So with that being said, enjoy the show. With the doctor of all secrets, James Arthur Ray. And I'm gonna be high as a as a fucking man. And now the stationary astronaut. All right, we are hot. James, how are you? We haven't spoken so long. Yeah, I'm outstanding, man. I, um, I'm, I'm super busy, which is the good news. It's it's a crazy year, and it seems like everybody I'm talking to feels like it's been kind of a crazy year. Uh, I don't know if that's the case for you or not. Yeah, um, we're kind of winding down and ramping up per usual with so many things going on with my company and what we do. Um, and I see your momentum picking up, and it's really exciting to see. How do you feel about it? Well, I feel good. It never happens as fast as you want it to, you know. Um, <laughs> no matter, no matter. Even if it's going to Mach ten, it seems like it's not fast enough. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm super grateful because, um, you know, given, given the what, what could be, I'm, I'm really, really blessed, and I'm just grateful to be able to do what I'm doing and fulfill my purpose and, and make it an impact on people's lives and their businesses. Is that what you would consider your purpose, making an impact on people's lives? Um, my purpose is to um, impact, influence, guide, and direct the infinite potential and the destiny of the entire human race. Um which is pretty pretty damn big, right? And also, and it continues, and to uh, decrease human suffering 
and increase human happiness and fulfillment. So that's my purpose. And I figure, you know, if I'm gonna gonna have one, it might as well be big. We decrease human suffering by first um, uplifting understanding, or how do we go about that? Boy, uh, that could take our whole time together. You know, suffering, I'm, as you might remember and know, um, I grew up in the Christian tradition. I have the utmost respect for that. I branched off as a you know, the son of a Protestant minister, I branched out and started studying Buddhism when I was 18 years old, which was kind of weird. I've always been a little, little weird. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so the Buddha said that life is suffering. And that's, you know, we don't like to hear that. But the reality is that that's pretty much the case. Now, it gets better than that because he said, you know, um, suffering arises, suffering, suffering ceases, and there's a way beyond suffering. So, and those are the three tenets of Buddhism, is that life is suffering, suffering arises, suffering, you know, ceases, there's a way beyond suffering. I guess that's four. And, and the way, you know, here, the way beyond suffering is to understand that, our salvation is in suffering. <laughs> and again, that's not popular in the West. But, but when you, here's how we suffer. Suffering doesn't have to happen, but it will. You know, we don't have to suffer. Now, pain is inevitable. Suffering is something we do to ourselves. So let me give you a quick example, um, Nick. Like, no one's ever died from a snake bite. Never. Mm -hmm. You know, snake bites, it hurts. Ow, you know, it hurts. There's pain. That's pain. What people die from is not removing the poison quickly enough. And so the poison is the suffering. So what happens is we have pain in our life. Well, pain is just pain. I mean, I, I just got back from the gym and I went through a lot of pain intentionally in the gym. I mean, pain is the mother of all growth. Now, we don't like to hear that either, but it's a fact nonetheless. I mean, go to the gym and tell your trainer, I want to get super jacked. I want to get in the best shape of my life. Um, I want to be strong and healthy and vibrant, and I don't want to sweat. I don't want to hurt. I don't want to be out of breath. Well, your trainer is going to say, good luck on that one. Pain is the mother of all growth. So pain is just pain. It, it comes and it goes. Suffering is something we create for ourselves because we we either don't address the pain or we or we resist it. You, are you with? Do you follow me on this? Yes. And, and so, so more practical exam, example, you know. And I was writing in my triple espresso this morning. I don't know if you read this. I write a mini blog on social media every day, <clears throat> and I said, you know, we learn the most in the darkest of night, potentially. Um, but the problem is, is that we want, so let's say we had a painful situation as a child and we don't know how to deal with it. So we just stuff it and we ignore it and we deny it. And yet it doesn't go away and we resist it. So that resistance and that attempting to ignore it, deny it, stuff it, which really is holding on to it, creates long-term suffering. Because that thing comes up again and again and again and again and again at an unconscious level. And so long answer to your question, how do we reduce human suffering, which is part of my purpose to reduce human suffering and to thereby increase happiness and fulfillment, is first of all, we have to become consciously aware of why and how we are creating our own suffering. Be so are we living for the light at the end of the tunnel or, or are we living for the darkness on our left and right? Um, well, we're living to live. 
You know, if we're living for the light at the end of the tunnel, then we're not really living. Anytime you're doing, you know, and, and I work with 85 to 90 percent entrepreneurs and leaders, you know, you know that. And, and so most entrepreneurs and leaders are doing what they do to get a bigger ROI or to have a better year or to make more money or to have more whatever. But that's not really doing for the sake of doing. I mean, when you really get dialed in and you're really living, then you're just doing what you do and you get your reward from what you're doing. The reward comes from doing what you're doing. Now, that's easier said than done because we're, we're hypnotized and we're programmed by socialized mind and by the mob mentality that we have to do to get. But doing to get is a surefire strategy to lack of fulfillment and suffering. <laughs> Here we come back to suffering. Because no matter what you get, Nick, I'm sure you've, you've you thought, well, if I get this new girlfriend – then I will be different. Or if I get this new boss, or if I get this new car, get this new house, then everything will be different. But it's not. You know, nothing that you get is going to make you be or experience any differently. You have to do that for yourself if you follow. Yes. Being a former athlete, I used to – because. I eventually learned it was all about the process and I used to think it was all about getting that win at the end at the at this game we were preparing for but really I realized the process throughout the moments with my teammates the locker room conversations the tough times with our coaching staff that's really what formed me as a human being it wasn't the gold at the end of the rainbow it wasn't the win that we deserved and we earned it was the process yeah, uh, I mean, well said, very well stated, and for you to get that makes you a rare individual because I, I remember, you know, I used to compete, believe it or not, in bodybuilding back in my 20s, and and I did okay. I did pretty well, even though I don't have the genetics uh, for that. I, I, I had the hustle, and, and I remember so many guys competing – and and not winning and then they'd be bummed out for three months yeah you know and 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 for me you know not i wasn't perfect at it but for me just to get up there and to be in my best shape ever and to give a hundred percent um i mean that's a win because i was competing against myself uh not against you know in my own genetics uh not against someone else. And so consequently, the same holds true in leadership and entrepreneurship, you know, and, and social media is notorious for making us miserable, mm -hmm. you know, because we look at everybody going, oh, I, I looked at this one so-called marketing guru um, on on Facebook, a quick video of him showing how he's getting on the private Jenny rented. And and I mean, this guy has gone from everything from let me teach you how to be an online marketer to let me teach you how to do an Airbnb to let me teach you how to get a bunch of new credit cards to let me teach you how to how to get it. Let me get you in a book club. I mean, this guy is like all over the board. And yeah. And so, you know, what I know looking at this is that, first of all, he hadn't found his purpose. Mm -hmm. And secondly, he's just chasing the dollar. And he's evidently, you know, whatever he's doing to chase it, it's not doing very well because he keeps bouncing from this thing to that thing to the other. And unfortunately, you know, to a lot of people, they buy it because he's got all kinds of views and all kinds of follows and so on and so forth. And so, you know, my objective is to help all of us, myself included, decrease suffering. And as we do that, then we realize, hey, there's painful events. Pain is just pain. And it always passes. And if I can just accept it, and it will pass. And the more I resist it and fight it and think it's unfair and hold on to it and so on and so forth, then I suffer. 
And going back to the original comment, there's some salvation in suffering. Even though we don't have to suffer, we're going to because we're going to resist and fight something. But at some point in time, we're going to suffer so much that we hopefully get to a point where we're like, hey, I'm, I'm, done, I'm done with this. I'm not going to be miserable anymore. And so that suffering has actually become a great teacher for us. You, does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. And knowing where you've come from, James, you've um, definitely, we talked about in our first episode with you, where you've kind of, you were the epitome of the hero's journey. Now, throughout that that um, journey, you are able to have seclusion. You are able to kind of find your higher self, which in turn allows us to know what our purpose is. How do you suggest people who don't end up in the same, uh, the same, uh, let's say, uh, terms your life ended up on, how are they in this comparative society we live, live in, how are they even going to come close to finding their purpose and tapping in to their higher self when we're, we have this ego driven society? So, so the title of this topic is how to find purpose for people who haven't lost everything and gone to prison. <laughs> hey, you said that I did. <laughs> it, it's tough, Nick. It, it really, really is tough, you know. And again, I, I, I wish I could say that that change isn't hard. It is hard, not because it has to be hard, but we make it hard, and we make it hard because we have. You know, first of all, let, let me give you a little science. So there's there's this whole field of science called epigenetics. And I don't know if you're familiar, but epigenetics basically yeah, I just, is just attended a grand rounds at Mayo Clinic a couple weeks ago with a Yale professor. She it was just incredible the study she did on the Holocaust survivors, their kids and their grandkids, as well as Vietnam veterans. It was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, here's here's the simple breakdown is that about 50% of who we are is based upon our genetic programming yes. and our conditioning. Now, that's, that's kind of sobering. So mm -hmm. that means that you are the byproduct of your mom and your dad and, and your ethnicity and your culture and all those kinds of things that you really had nothing to do with. I mean, in which the grand is, scheme of things. Which is nature. Yeah, which is nature. And then on the flip side. Is nurture. Yes. Right? So, so you know, there's this whole big conversation, and there has been for a long, long time. Are we the product, of byproduct of our nature or our nurture? Well, the answer is both. And, and so 50% is genetics. You come in and, you know, you mentioned this, the, the Holocaust survivors, uh, people of the Jewish culture, and, and you know, there's people of, of the Native American, and there's people of the African American, and there's people of, of German descent, and so on and so forth. And, and so... European and and so you are fifty percent programmed by your genetics and that's that's kind of scary in a sense mm. but the flip side good news is is that leaves fifty percent left over yep. so the other fifty percent tells us that we can rise above our genetic program you are not your story. You are yes. not your history. You are not your parents. You are not, you are not what happened to your grandparents. You are not any of that unless mm -hmm. and until you buy into it and continue to hold on to it. And, th and this goes back to the difference between pain and suffering. So, mm -hmm. so pain is pain. I mean, none of us are going to argue that certain cultures have had a lot of pain. They've, had, they've, been, they've been abused. They've been misused. They've been not treated very well. They, you know, there's been all kinds of prejudice. And that's painful. It's pain. And what causes the suffering 
is prolonging the pain by holding on to it instead of just letting it go and healing it and saying, hey, finding the gift in that, easier said than done. But, you know, let me push some buttons here for some people. September 11th, in, you know, in the United States of America, it was a hor- horrible day. I, I remember it as clear as as yesterday because I was speaking in Orlando, Florida. I followed I, you know, Zig Ziglar opened up and I was the next guy up and they took a break after Zig and they went out all the, I was speaking to a stadium of 8,000 people and they all went out on the break to the bathroom. There were TV monitors in the hallways and the, the news was broadcasting the twin towers falling. So now break is over and they're coming back in. Some people left immediately. The people filing back in. Ladies and gentlemen, next speaker, James Arthur Ray. Can you imagine <laughs> what, I, what I was walking into here a- after that? Okay. And, and so, but here's the point. You know, what year was that? 2000, 2001, right? I mean, we're, we're still, still bringing up the pain all these years later. And, and again, I'm pushing some buttons because some people are thinking I'm being disrespectful. I'm, I'm maybe, but I'm not. You know, at some point in time, pain is pain. We all have pain. It was a horrible thing. And at what point do you stop the suffering? Because nobody's happy on September 11th when we're when we're showing the videos again and we're doing all of those kinds of things that we tend to do. You're going to say something. That's um, I'm so glad you brought that up because the main point in this professor's uh, grand rounds was regarding what really is PTSD. So we have something that happened to us 18 years ago, 20 years ago, Vietnam veterans, 25 years ago, 50 years ago. It can no longer be considered PTSD. It is just a big bubble of stress. So if we look at it in that term, what do we do? Because it, it was based on cortisol levels and things like that. That's where that I'm um, to get back to our point with understanding, James, understanding that what's done is done. If we keep reliving in the past, well, then we're sending ourselves through the ringer. And that's suffering. Yes. And that's suffering. We're living. We're not living. We're living in a, in a memory. And, and, Frankly, I mean, this is, you know, I I work, again, with leaders, executives, entrepreneurs, and I have a model called the five dimensions of leadership and ultimate performance. And each of those five dimensions are critically important, not only for personal performance, but also for for business and organizational performance. And it's a diagnostics tool that I work, I use in my one-on-one coaching, as well as if I go in and do business consulting work with the entire business. But one of those, one of the quadrants, there's five dimensions. So one of the aspects of dimensions of that model is psychology. And most of us in today's world are looking at strategy. If you look at what most people want, they want a new strategy. Let me give, give me a marketing strategy. Give me a sales strategy. Give me a communication strategy. Give me whatever strategy. And if you go to social media, that's where it gets really crazy. Download this swipe file, get this blueprint, make a million dollars in five minutes, you know, um, <laughs> and I'm being somewhat facetious, but, but the fact fact is, is that your psychology always drives your strategy. How you think and feel always determines how you act. And, and so what I know, because uh, you know, about 95% of the work I do in my one-on-one coaching, as well as in my business consulting, is psychological. Because when I can help people change the internal game, then the external game will change with it. When you change the psychology, how you think and feel, then the strategies that you get will be applied and they can be sustained. So let's go back to epigenetics. <clears throat> what 50% of you know the Holocaust, the September 11th, all these things that are that I'm not agreeing with at all. They they were horrible. Right? And 
we don't fix them by by continually rerunning them over and over and over. Now, those are big examples. But let's also take the example of someone who hurt you in your childhood. You know, that's a very common example. Or someone, someone, an ex-husband or wife who screwed you over and didn't respect you or whatever. That's a very common example. Well, you don't fix yourself by continually holding on to that snake bite and leaving the venom in your body. And so the good news in epigenetics is that, yeah, 50% is our nature, um, but the other 50% is our nurture. And what our nurture is, is divided into 10% environment. So 10% of who you are is, your, is, is impacted by your environment. Now, your environment is, contains a whole lot of things. You know, I have my, I, I teach people to be uh, coaches and business consultants, and I have my Prometheus Academy of Leadership and Business Acceleration, and, and what my, my first year um, coaches in training are doing right now is a whole environmental inventory, taking a look at what they surround themselves with. You know, if you if you got, and this is a really mundane example, but if you got a couch in your living room and every time you sit down on it, a spring pokes you in the ass, it probably doesn't really feel very empowering. It probably doesn't feel... Do what? It's not conducive it's, if it's consistent. Exactly. So it's telling you that you need a, a new damn couch and and that you're not where you need to be. If if the music you're playing in your environment, if the things you're watching on on Netflix and Voodoo or whatever, you know, I refuse and I'm not a prude by any means. I'm just I'm just wise enough to know that I want to empower myself. I refuse to watch these these um, movies that where people are getting their heads cut off and getting blown to pieces, and it's so graphic. And, and now we're so numb to those things that you know. And <laughs> nothing against Quentin Tarantino, but damn, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's just it, it's it's we're numb to that. And I watched, I, I saw a, a movie, I, I watch movies, I don't watch TV very often, but there was a movie that was recommended, and it was supposed to be a comedy, and in the first 10 minutes, this guy had like blown off two people's heads, and it was supposed to be funny. And, and I just like, I, I'm not going to watch this, because I'm not going to put that in my environment, because your body is an environment too, and that also includes diet, includes all those things. So 10% of you overcoming that 50% of your nature, your genetics, is driven by your environment. And that also includes people you spend your time with. I mean, if you are surrounding yourself consistently with people who are down and dumpy and depressed and they're energy vampires and they suck the life out of you, chances are great you're going to suck too because that's what vampires do. And, and so you got – you got to take life seriously enough if you want to crawl out of the morass to change that. 40% of, how, of who you can become and crawl beyond your genetics is your habits. So you got 10% environment, 40% habits, your daily habits. You know, how do you wake up in the morning? What do you, what's your self talk? What do you put? into your mind again and what do you eat on a regular basis do you go and exercise you know or do you do you couch potato you know what are your habits and and so we have that ability to move beyond the pain and move out of the suffering to come full circle back to where we started nick and the problem is though that most of us don't do it because we're so much on autopilot and we don't have the discipline and the willpower to take our power back. So we're basically giving our power away to something that was handed to us by grandma and grandpa and mommy and daddy and God knows who, and we're not really living our own life. 
James, it's so interesting. Um, I found myself working with arguably, you know, 80, 85 percent entrepreneurs um, since last year. And it's so consistent how the ones that are pulling the veil off are the entrepreneurs. They are realizing the power of their habits, the power of their surroundings, auditing their circle. And we could attribute it to the fact that they're forced to create money out of thin air. But I'm seeing the droned out society are the employees of the world. I come from the land of Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is our largest employer in our state. My wife works for them. My family works for them. 41,000 employees in, in our city alone, and we're only a city of 130,000 people. It's so interesting to see the variation and the difference between the droned out employees and the free wielding, self discovering entrepreneurs. Well, I think you're absolutely correct because if you go, this is the age of the entrepreneur. And mm-hmm. If you roll back, you know, I've been around um, more years than you have, Nick. And and if you roll back the clock a couple of decades, it wasn't really the age of the entrepreneur. But the entrepreneurs that do it did exist were real estate agents. They were mortgage brokers. They were network marketers. Um, they were franchise owners. And those still exist today, but that there's a lot more entrepreneurs in other arenas now than what existed then. And that's, you know, I've worked with the best of the best. If you look at any of the largest network marketing companies, I've either coached their top performers or I've spoken at their annual conventions. You look at any of the great, the biggest real estate companies, same thing. Mortgage brokers, same thing. Um, Merrill Lynch. I mean, you can see all that on my website. But the point is, is that people who take responsibility for their own life, who don't earn a paycheck, who know they have to create their own paycheck, if you will, come to the realization very quickly that your results are a reflection of you. And if you want your results to grow, you have to grow. If you want your results to change, you have to change because they're a reflection of you. And and guess what, Nick? You know, quantum physics is telling us that now. I mean, quantum physics is the mysticism of the 21st century. If you look at quantum entanglement, you look at, at... at a what's called a tangled hierarchy, and I won't get too complex here today, but basically what physics now tells us through scientific proof is that you don't observe anything in your outside world. You actually place it in your outside world from inside of you. And guess what? Neurosciences, Nobel Prize winning neurosciences tells us the same thing. Carl Prebram, you don't observe anything in the outside world that isn't coming from your inside world. So what you're looking at in your bank account, in your business, in your relationships, in your in your health, in your fitness, in your surroundings, you're looking at you. And so if you want that to change, you have to change. James, it's almost like you just classified everyone as a stationary astronaut. <laughs> you know, you've never discussed, you never told me um, how you came up with that name. It's an interesting name. Well, it's kind of, it's got everything um, we're talking about all balled up into just an oxymoron. It is. Um, it's not external, it's internal. We We can only reach the stars if we go deep within ourselves. Right. Well, well, you know, I don't know if you um, if you know the work of Nassim Haramein, but but this guy is a is literally a savant mm-hmm. and and he's a physicist. And what is now proven through mathematics, Nick, is that we have the power of the entire universe in one proton of every single cell in our body. Now we've got trillion, we've got billion, trillions of cells, and we've got within those trillions of cells, we have billions of atoms, and every single atom has one proton in it. And 
you know, 10 to the 50th power is the, the energy of the zero point field or the plenum or whatever you want to call it. I mean, that's 10 with 50 zeros after it. And that same, that same power is in one proton in just one cell of your body. And by the way, you've got billions of, of cell you've got in one atom rather of your body. And by the way, you've got billions of atoms in trillions of cells. So, you know, stationary astronaut, I'm glad you finally tuned me in and why why I'm so slow on the uptake, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, it, to be honest, and I kind of want to talk about this, uh, a um, cortisol reboot, um, a, a big uh, astronomical way people are succumb or um, uh, climbing over post-traumatic stress disorder is through plant medicine. Now, I am an advocate. That's actually where the name Stationary Astronaut came from, was me on a mat in the middle of the Amazon jungle puking my guts out with world leaders and moguls, um, <laughs> drinking, ay <laughs> drinking ayahuasca. And I realized, I was like, I'm out there, but I'm right here. And it was so interesting because – when you figure out, you know, when they balance your chakra system and your glands are cleaned out and and you feel like a trillion dollars, there's something that happens, James, in in regards to your understanding and being able to observe how you were suffering from a different angle to the point it it no longer suits you. It's almost like I was giving thanks to it. And I've been down multiple times and and drank with some of the some of the best, but it's just a matter of changing my perception and, and Michael Pollan just wrote a book um, recently, which was very interesting. Have you ever dove into um, plant medicine or tried to understand or, or partake in yourself? Um, yes, sir. I have. And, uh, you know, I've probably done it, about every single modality and method to explore consciousness that exists. And, and I'll tell you, <laughs> I came to it very resistant because growing up in a staunch, you know, traditional Christian household, I never even, I never even drank. I never did anything, you know, that was all quote a sin. And, and so I was very resistant to it until I started, you know, studying, with with the shamans and I, I studied for several years with a with a Kiero shaman out in from Peru. He was a descendant of the of the Inca, which if you know anything about their tradition, it's it's pretty incredible. They are the are the second most prolific as far as building uh, incredible structures next to the Egyptians. Now, you know, we could go off on, on a tangent and, and say there's some experts who say the Egyptians didn't even do that, and, and that's a whole other conversation, but it, it predated the Egypt, Egyptians, but that's another conversation. But the point is that I finally started recognizing as I studied uh, in the Amazon and I studied in in Peru and and all these places that maybe I should be a little bit more open-minded. I've never been a partier. I never will be. Um, when I did uh, experience psychoactives, it was always in a, in a very safe and controlled place. And, and when I um, experienced ayahuasca, which you mentioned, which I have done numerous times, it was always in a maloca, which a maloca is a temple. In, in the Amazon, and it was always approached very respectfully and, and for one purpose, you know, I mean, first of all, if you, if you want to experience ayahuasca as a party, knock yourself out because you will be knocked out. It's not a party. Um, and so, yes, long answer to your question, I have experienced those things and, and I, it, it, it you know, they call it the death vine. The shaman call it the death vine. And they call it that um, because it is as close to a death experience as you can have. We have, according to, to science and what we know, is that we have two major DMT experiences in our entire physical life. One is upon birth, um, where the pineal gland dumps a bunch of DMT, and, and one is at death. And then... 
every between you know the birth and the and the exit it <laughs> the pineal gland basically doesn't do much of anything and, and nobody you know can figure it out science is trying to figure out what the hell it's for and and they can't figure it out but but what what the traditions maintain is that it's it's a gateway to to something higher bigger broader you know more expansive and when you take ayahuasca it basically has two ingredients in it which you probably already know you know one of them is dmt and one of them is an mao inhibitor which which allows the dmt to cross the blood brain barrier and it goes right to the pineal gland and the pineal gland sucks it up like a sponge and you are jettisoned into the zero point field and depending upon the dosage that you take um you know is 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 that tells you how far you're going to go and and i've been pretty damn far um and it's it's life changing it's life altering and you know the whole objective of this from the shamanic standpoint is that they want to circumnavigate the afterlife and they they are, I mean, a shaman, a real shaman, and there's a lot of drugstore shaman, but I'm talking about the real deal. They map out this whole experience. And, you know, this is true in Hinduism as well as in, you know, the Egyptian culture was incredibly fascinated with the afterlife. And, and what the objective is, is that if you are able to become lucid and consciously aware in that old that extreme altered state then when you die you'll be able to to have a whole different experience versus just getting blown into smithereens because you don't know what the hell's going on that's um kind of why they're doing uh you know lsd trials on dying patients and things just to allow them to one be comfortable with the experience and two be able to possibly navigate and that's the beauty of working with seasoned shamans who have been doing this for decades and then their their bloodline um sings this song too is they nothing surprises them they have seen it all there is nothing you could tell them. Me just trying to put it into words is already doing it ill justice. And I always tell people there's a paradigm shift that happens. There's life before ayahuasca and life after. And life after will never be the same. You'll never be able to perceive uh, situations the same way you used to. It almost rips cynicism out of you and it allows you to, um, you know, you got everything you went there for times a million. Yeah, and and I have a, a little bit more caution on that. I because I was uh, in the Amazon with an actress. There there was a small group of us, and one of them was an actress who I won't say the name, but but if you have not done a considerable amount of foundation work. Yeah. Prior to going into an extreme psychoactive experience, it it can spin you out and spin you out hard. I mean, this particular activist went into this altered state and, and couldn't get back. And I've seen that happen more than once. The other yeah. thing that you have to realize is that when you go into those kinds of altered states, the things that will come up for you, that's why I, I've never I've never done LSD, um, but I've heard and read a lot about it. And the you know, some people have what's called a bad trip and some people have a good trip. Well, the reason that you have a bad trip or a good trip is because of who you are. And what's inside of you. And if you've done a lot of work to heal your own pain and decrease your own suffering and in, and, and in, or, or decrease your own suffering and increase your own happiness and fulfillment, then you will tend to have a more blissful experience. If you have not, you know, you will go to hell. You can <laughs> literally go to hell. And because you haven't dealt with those things, it's going to take you into your unconscious. And if you have a lot of suppressed issues and denied issues and unresolved emotional issues and traumas, it, it will bring those up for you 
flat up in your face and there's no way you can deny and suppress them because your conscious mind is no longer in control. Yeah, I think um, I think uh, the cynicism point I made is actually uh, very um, that is uh, uh, that needs to be put at bay because I've seen people have to get sent back up the river. I was down my first year. Um, I was down there with you know a stripper from Miami who had a rough, rough childhood. She could financially afford to fly out, but the thing is, she wasn't quite expect. She had had other trips prior and thought she was a seasoned vet but oh boy mother ayahuasca put her on her butt and she went through hell but don't get me wrong she survived the week but i've also seen people like an oil tycoon from texas brought his daughter down there who was not ready for the experience and they had to leave midweek because she was just sending herself through the brigade of hell and same thing with me my first year i think my fourth night it was bound to happen I had to break break the seal, and I sent myself through hell, just through my own um, want to be in control. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and and that can be, you know, depending upon your constitution, it, it can be a very empowering experience, um, and it can be incredibly disempowering and spin you out if your constitution is not such that you you know how to deal with it so so my whole i don't talk a lot about these things i have you know periodically previously because i think you have to approach them with a tremendous amount of respect and my my advocacy is you know i've had clients who said oh i'm going to do go to this ayahuasca and they think it's just going to be sexy and cool and i'm like it's it's not it's not like that no you need to do the work and and, and you know there's some people who think and, and anytime you get into circles you know there's some people who think okay you don't have to do any work you just drink ayahuasca and it'll do all the work for you well i say horse hockey and that's a technical term you know and nothing's going to do the work for you you always had to do the work for yourself now what what a psychoactive can do is is open a portal to give you an experience beyond your normal third dimensional experience and therefore once you've had that now now you can work to get it back on your own i mean if you look at i i studied buddhism you know studied with a zen monk for years and and what you'll find out is that a lot of zen monks join go into priesthood in the monastery after having an lsd experience because you know if you're dependent upon any kind of psychoactive or external, then you're not empowered. You're dependent. And so a lot of these monks will have an LSD experience and they'll go, damn, you know, that's in me. That's in my consciousness. I have access to that. So let me figure out how to get there myself. Um, and, and that for me is what is good about some of these things at some point in your journey is that It'll open a portal and a pathway, but then you got to come back and walk the pathway yourself again and again and again and again and again, or it'll just overgrow itself and you'll be dependent upon, you know, something external. Any good shaman will tell you that the medicine is just a bridge. The work is on you, chap. Right. Exactly. It's so interesting because we're seeing kind of the, uh, I would call it the bastardization of ayahuasca. I I think it's, um, there's so much disrespect going on in the Western world right now. I actually talked with Graham Hancock um, in 2015. I had just gotten back from the jungle for my first time, and he ended his talk at the University of Minnesota um, saying more, we need more ayahuasca. And then we talked privately and he was, he was talking about how the United States, we need it here. We need it here. But the thing is the United States hasn't done the work to prepare itself for the power of what ayahuasca is going to bring. That, that is so well said. I, I completely agree. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, one of the seven laws of the universe is the law of polarity, and the law of polarity 
it, it it operates from the most mundane to the most magnificent. I mean, it, you look, you see the law of polarity on the battery on your car. There's a positive and a negative pole, and you cannot start your car unless both poles are connected. And so everything has an up and a down, a right and a left, and that happens. You know, from the smallest, if you look at quantum physics all the way down to the subatomic, there's a positron, which has a positive charge. There's an electron, which has a negative charge. And they never, you will never find one without the other. They always are in equal pairs. And and so now I've chunked that all the way up to our planet. Well, if you look at the eastern hemisphere of our planet compared to the west, the east to the west, there's polarity here. In the in the east, they have set and contemplated their own minds, you know, for for decades and decades and decades. And and they have made so many breakthroughs in consciousness and awareness in the Eastern traditions. But if you look at gains in the physical world, you know, <laughs> It's and I'm going to be somewhat facetious here, but they're barely beyond yak butter. I mean, you know, it's 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 changing somewhat because the West has such a powerful influence. But now you flip over to the polar opposite, which is the West, and we've made quantum leaps in our technology and our economics and our impact on the physical world. But spiritually, we're still in the Stone Age. You know, I mean, we're still believing and buying into things that we believed and buy, bought into in the agrarian age. And I'm not being disrespectful, but we're not moving forward spiritually. So so we harmonize each other. The East, you know, has much more consciousness and awareness. The West has much more physical prowess and, and accomplishment and contribution in the physical world. But Neither one of them has this harmonic relationship, which is comprehensive and integrated. And I believe that's leadership for the future. The leadership for the future is the spiritual entrepreneur who understands what I alluded to earlier about quantum physics is that spirit is the animating principle of this universe. That's what the tradition, you know, the esoteric traditions call it spirit. Uh, you know, science would call it energy. It doesn't matter what you call it because it could care less. It's the animating principle of this universe. And so a spiritual entrepreneur is an individual who realizes that everything comes from the same source. You know, 10 to the 50th power in the universe is in one proton of every single cell of your body. So you've got the entire universe within you, and you have the power within you. And so consequently, to the degree we understand that, we become spiritual, not necessarily religious. And if you're religious, I respect that. But spirituality is a connectivity to to everything, to, to you know, a plant, to a person, to a Porsche, to a palace, to a planet. We're all connected and we all are quantum entangled and we all have an impact on everything. And to the degree that we start to wake up now to that, then we start to realize that we are not going, let's, let's come back full circle, Nick. We're not our story. We're not our history. We're not our programming. We're not our past pain. We're so much more than that. And when we start to wake up and realize it, then we take our power back and we can literally move this whole planet forward together. Isn't it magical to realize whether it's in a psychedelic experience, uh, experience whether it's at the gym, whether it's when we stub our toe, how irrelevantly relevant. Oh, sorry. Let me decline that how irrelevantly relevant we are as a single human being. So what I mean by that is I ain't shit and I don't know shit. All the while I have the potential to be great and know a lot. <laughs> I'm just a little peon, but I can make a big difference. But I, I, a huge difference because, because I'm God in human form. 
Yes. <laughs> I am God in human form. Now, am I the totality of God? Hell no. But I'm God in human form, you know, and, and I have that ability. And where, you know, when you say I ain't, I ain't shit and I don't know shit, you know, where we, where we run awry, and I see a lot of this in my history, is when things start popping for us, we tend to think that we we are shit and we know everything. And that's where we run into problems because then life comes along and goes, okay, hot stuff. You know, try this on for size and, t- and show, me, show me what you got, right? And knocks us sideways. And then we go, you know, into pain. And because we don't like it, we go into suffering. And again, I'm coming back to these topics because I want – your listener to understand that while I talk about my job is to decrease human suffering, I'm not, I'm not a pro at not suffering. You know, I, I do suffer and hopefully I'm much less now because of the realization that it's my own choice to suffer and it's my own resistance. And, and I suffer when I hold on to, to things that really I am not and don't and don't really matter to me. But we have a huge impact. How do you change the world? You change the world by changing your world. And when you change the world, you know, some traditions maintain and I believe it there's there's only one one self here. You know, there's 8 billion different little players in the game, but but eight uh, nearly eight billion of us are not the self. What we call the self is a very, very flimsy personality that we've created based upon a story or imagination or memory. Um, but there's only one self here, and to the degree we start to understand that and experience that, then we start to have a whole lot more understanding and a whole lot more compassion for the other players in the game. How do you see the power of one being extrapolated in the 21st century with um, nature and animals and such? I'm not sure I understand your question. The power of one with natures and animals. Help me with that. Okay, so like early in the 2000s, it was the cliche term, the power of one. But everyone kind of looked at it as this is big before the big veganism, um, the veganism push uh, through Netflix documentaries and such. But it was always just us humans. And then over the last decade, we've realized that the that the trees in the Pacific Northwest are the root system is actually breathing and moving up and down, up and down. Uh, how is the power of one going to grow without giving people uh, heroic doses of LSD, magic mushrooms, and ayahuasca? Well, I think there's a lot of people who have taken ayahuasca who still don't understand the power of one. True. You know, because because the power of one includes everything from from a rock to a tree to an animal to a plant, to a person, to a planet. It includes everything. And and that's, you know, in the Kabbalistic tradition, they, they state, in all things great and small, I see the beauty of divine expression. In all things great and small. So, you know, I, I am not a fanatic about anything. Uh, you brought it up, so I will share with you that I am a vegetarian, I am a vegan, and I made that decision. This is the second go-round. Um, I did it for about five years, some years back, and then I went off. And now, you know, I've been a vegetarian vegan for probably going on three years again. And, and it's just, for me, here's what I know is you're right. The the rainforests are the lungs of our planet. And if we and we're mowing it down, I don't know how many acres per day to graze more beef cattle. Yep. I mean, that's the fact. And and so again, if if you as a listener, if I'm not here to to preach veganism or vegetarianism you have to make your own choices but but just look at the facts i mean beef cattle are the greatest contributor to global warming far beyond carbon emissions and we know this we know this 
and yet we're not, you know, we're still talking carbon emissions because there's too many economics and too much politics involved in beef cattle farming. And, and so it's a, it's a big thing you're asking about. And, and I, I came to it, you know, kind of slowly this second time because originally I was like, okay, uh, so beef cattle are contributing to global global warming, climate change. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut that out. I can do that. And and here's here's what we know, Nick. You you make a bigger contribution. You might not want to cut out beef, and that's that's your choice, and that's cool. As as a as a listener, I who am I to tell you what to do? I'm not qualified. But here's what I will tell you: is if you cut out beef one day a week, you make a greater contribution to decreasing or, or positively impacting climate change than you do by driving a Tesla. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not against Tesla, and I'm a big Elon Musk fa- fan, so I love Teslas. But, but the fact is, it's not about carbon emissions. It, it, that's a very small piece of it. And, and so, you know, in the Sufi tradition, if, if any of your viewers or listeners saw me in The Secret and watched the outtakes You'll you'll remember I the bloopers, you know, where I attempted to quote the Sufi tradition numerous times, and and I flubbed it up, and I finally got it right. But basically, it said, you know, it says God sleeps in the rock, dreams in the plant, stirs in the animal, and awakens in man. And I love that because what that is telling us is exactly what what quantum physics is telling us you know uh max planck the father of quantum physics stated and as i and i quote matter does not exist as we know it upon behind all apparent matter is a conscious, intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Now, this is not a spiritual guru. This is not a personal development guru. This is a quantum physicist, the father of quantum physics. Mind is the matrix of all matter. So consequently, if when we get that, then we start to develop this utmost respect. Is there consciousness in a in a rock? Yes, there is, according to quantum physics. Now, is there awareness? No, not so much. There's a difference. Consciousness is is that spirit. It's the animating principle. It there's consciousness, but awareness is different. Is there is there consciousness? In a plant, yes, there is. Now, is there awareness? A little bit more. Yeah, it's just a little bit more. Look at the uh, the research by. Uh, oh God, his name slips me. Um, he he wrote a book called The Secret Life of Plants. His name will come to me here in a minute. Cleve Baxter, and. And he did all this research on on the consciousness and awareness of plants. I mean, we've known for how long that if you talk to your plants and you're loving to your plants, they respond. So there has to be consciousness there. You know, is there consciousness and awareness in an animal? Sure there is. You know, different degrees depending upon what the animal is, you know, Um so on and so forth. So you, you begin to you begin to have this utmost respect and and it makes it hard for me. You know, my my fiance bought me a fish tank. I didn't want a fish tank. Mm-hmm. I I thought fish were a dumb pet and I've been corrected. You know, but these fish they know me. They come up, you know, when I come to feed them in the morning, they come up to the glass and and they're all excited and so they have some consciousness. So now for me to eat a fish recognizing that it had been killed for me to eat it it it's hard for me and again if you have a different view i respect that i'm not here to change it but that's that's what develops as we start to have 
a broader view, and I'll just say this, and I know we got to bounce because we're running out of time, but there's three different levels, basically, of awareness. There's egocentric, which says, I care about me, and I don't really give a shit about anyone else. And then there's ethnocentric, which says, me and my clan, me and my family, me and my culture, make America great again, but we don't give a shit about anyone else. You know, that's ethnocentric. And then there's world-centric, which says the entire planet, the, everybody, everything is important and valuable, and we're all in this together. If we, if we continue to mow down the rainforest, we're not just killing the trees. We're killing ourselves. Oh, we are just a demolition derby, James. And I think um, I'm glad we talked about diet because that's probably where it's going to start is once we start consciously eating, we might be moving in the right direction to actually write this shit. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, how cool it is, is that when you start to become aware, my, my, um, fiance soon to be wife um, was saying to me the other day and this is going to sound real foo-foo for some but there's consciousness in everything and she said you know this is going to sound weird maybe but but when i was preparing the vegetables i could feel the life force within them and i said that doesn't sound weird to me at all that sounds pretty damn awake you know and and so um anyway Maybe we leap off on diet next time we talk, um, because I, what I will say is if you want to have a lot of life, you need to add, eat a lot of live foods, not dead foods. Ooh, you heard it here first, folks. James, once again, we struck gold. I'm so happy to have um, uh, maintained this bond with you, and it's really awesome because we really go deep with our conversations, and I know our listeners really enjoy it. Well, it's my pleasure, Nick, and you're doing great work, and, and you take me places where others don't take me, um, and it's fun to go there. Uh, next time we talk, I promise if we're going to do video, I'll, I'll clean up, and I won't look so scraggly so I can be on camera with you as well. Uh, or maybe I'll, I'll maybe I'll just wear a ball cap like you are and, and, uh, <laughs> and go sporty. <laughs> a boy. Hey, so um, stay on with me. I'm going to stop recording. I want to uh, give you an opportunity off the air. Hold on one second. Okay. Ooga, chaka, ooga.